So I'm Doug Reichler. I am the uh, chair of the uh, section on medicine and the arts for the College of Physicians of Philadelphia. And I'm here to uh, welcome our, you in our audience. I would like to be able to see you, but uh, such as the limitation of Zoom in, in this format, the webinar, we can't see you, but uh, we, you will have a chance to communicate with us, ask questions later by typing into the, uh, the chat. Uh, or the q and I guess you can do either one. I'm here to introduce our, our guest speaker and, uh, and interviewer. We're honored to have Dr. Michelle Harper speaking uh, tonight with us. The simplest way for me to introduce her is simply to read a couple of paragraphs from the, the jacket of her book, which I think describes very nicely what the book that she wrote and published last year is, is about and what it's doing. The book is The Beauty and Breaking, for those of you who uh, haven't read it. I hope many of you have. It's done very well with, on the New York Times bestseller list. She is a, a, an African American emergency physician in a profession that's overwhelmingly male and white. Brought up in Washington, D.C., in a complicated family, she went to Harvard where she met her husband and they stayed together through medical school until just before she was to join the staff of a hospital in Philadelphia when he told her he couldn't move with her. Her marriage at an end, Harper began her new life in a new city, in a new job, and as a newly single woman. In the ensuing years, as she learned to become an effective emergency physician, bringing insight and empathy to every patient encounter, Harper came to understand that each of us is broken, physically, emotionally, psychically. How we recognize those breaks, how we try to mend them, and where we go from here are all crucial parts of the healing process. And I, I think she has done a wonderful job of explaining that and, and telling her own story, be a very honest and open rendition of her own story in the book, uh, as well as uh, telling the stories of, of patient interactions that have, that have led to uh, her own development uh, as a physician. So what, what we will do is we've asked um, Dr. Harper to, re to read for a few minutes. She's going to read a, 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 the introduction to the book. And then we will have our interviewer, our, our professional uh, journalist interviewer, and uh, my colleague from Temple, Mike Vitez. Uh, Mike is a 30-year veteran of the Philadelphia Inquirer, and uh, he's a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist. And in the last five years, he's been serving as the director of narrative medicine for Temple, uh, working uh, with me there in medical humanities. And uh, it's been very, it's been wonderful and inspiring to have Mike. Uh, working with the, with the medical students and the residents and the faculty at Temple. So with that said, I will turn things over to Dr. Harper to give, to start with the reading. Oh, let me, I'm sorry, let me, one other thing I wanna say is that after Mike interviews Dr. Harper, we will open it up to questions from the audience. So put your questions as they come up into the chat and uh, we will try to get to uh, all the questions that, that you have uh, for, uh, for Dr. Harper. So. Dr. Harper. Thank you for the introduction. And it is wonderful to be with you all here today. And without further ado, I'll get to the introduction. As I cradled my patient's head in my hands, I looked past the watery wells of his eyes. For a moment, I didn't notice the blood that ran in rivulets across my gloves as it poured from his scalp, or the bits of gray and white brain matter that dotted the sheets, the beeping of the monitors around me, the popping sound of IV catheter tops being flicked off by nurses, the screeching of wheels as equipment was dragged across linoleum floors, the nurses and techs yelling directions at one another, the stifled gasps erupting from the two medical students on their first ER shift, attempting in vain not to be startled. All were drowned out as I stood over this young man and tried to ease his agitation. This is the part of being a doctor that medical school doesn't cover, that case reviews don't prepare you for. This is the part you can't really know until you're in the moment. You are the person responsible for saving the human life that slowly slips through your fingers while silently begging for final redemption under the demanding fluorescent lights. I am the doctor whose palms boaster the head of the 20 year old man with a gunshot wound to his brain. I support the baby as she takes her first breath outside her mother's womb. I hug the wife whose husband is dying from advanced liver disease as she implores the universe to take away his pain. I claim no special powers, nor do I know how to handle death any better than you. 
what I know is that for 36 hours a week, I reside in the melee that is a hospital emergency room where I'm called upon to be sal, antidote, and sometimes charon. Most of the time, my job is to keep death at bay. When I am successful, I send the patient back out into the world. When I'm not, I am there as life passes away. I'm not so deluded as to think that I alone am capable of making that kind of difference. I'm well aware that the determination of who lives and who dies doesn't happen at my hands alone. There are times when, despite the designs of any patient, family member, friend, or doctor, death will come. Then I am witness. What I can do is be the fairy woman who holds the body as the last breath escapes. The one who, like the night sentinel, calls out the hour and does her best to convey that all is well. Like everyone, I am in this world for only a brief time and as for many, blessings abound in my life and they abound amid the struggle, amid my struggle. Over the decades, I've learned to cultivate a personal state of stillness. As a child, that stillness grew from a dissociation I stumbled upon that allowed me to better endure a life with a father who was a batterer and with a family legacy of victimhood. As a black woman, I navigate an American landscape that claims to be post-racial when every waking moment reveals the contrary. An American landscape that requires all women to pound tenaciously against the proverbial glass ceiling, which we've since discovered is made of palladium, the kind of glass that would sooner bow than shatter. When I began writing this book, I had started over. My marriage to my college sweetheart had ended. I had moved to a new city to start a new job. Plagued with doubt, I found myself having to reevaluate my life. Living through such changes was difficult. Now I see those junctures when everything I had counted on came to an abrupt end as a privilege. They gave me the opportunity to be uncertain. And in that uncertainty grew opportunity from childhood to now, I've been broken many times. I suspect most people have. In practicing the Japanese art of kintsukuroi, one repairs broken pottery by filling in the cracks with gold, silver, or platinum. The choice to highlight the breaks with precious metals not only acknowledges them, but also pays tribute to the vessel that has been torn apart by the mutability of life. The previously broken object is considered more beautiful for its imperfections. In life too, even greater brilliance can be found after the mending. As an emergency medicine physician, I know how to be still for others. I know how to call to down the gods of repose and silence, to take the measure of their power in the moments when I need it most. This stillness I inhabit as I pause, push, breathe, and grow. The stories I will tell here, I hope, take you into the chaos of emergency medicine and show you where the center is. This center is where we find the sturdy roots of insight that can't be wind thrown by passing storms. In their grounding, they offer nourishment that can, should we allow it, lead to lives of ever increasing growth. I had to find this center for myself as I took stock of experiences that were exceedingly painful, yet ultimately filled me with the promise of a meaningful rebirth a rebirth that is worth the surviving, worth the healing, worth the repair. Beautifully done. I, I, I especially love the image of the vase and the, and the mended vase, even more beautiful than the original. That's a, a, a beautiful passage. And, and thank you for sharing. Um, thank, you. thank you for writing the book, uh, which will lead me, Dr. Harper, to my first question, which is you sort of alluded to it in your introduction there, but why did you write it? What motivated you to write it? Where did the idea come from? Why did you write it? I think the seeds of this book were first planted in residency. Now, I had mentioned I didn't start writing it till after I graduated when I was attending. Um, but there were stories that just stayed with me. Um, people from just all aspects of their lives, like the woman who was brought in covered in cuts, small cuts all over her body. Um, not deep enough, not significant enough medically to kill her, mm -hmm. but certainly to cause pain and suffering. And, you know, I thought to myself, like when we found out how it happened and it was her ex-partner, 
how would a person do this? What would drive them to want to do this to another human being? What would make this man think that, that was an acceptable um, expression of his rage and hatred? And then how did their past collide? And how was she, certainly she was going to survive what happened to her medically, but what about the scars she would be left with? Physically, certainly, but then psychically, what does that healing process look like? So that's really why over and over again, these experiences that I've had personally, that my patients have. And although it's a memoir, you know, the structure is, I start with stories about myself and then focuses on patient experiences and, and aspects of my life interwoven between. Right. And that was really intentional because what's important to me is our interconnectedness as human beings. And I feel like if we acknowledge that and honor that, that's part of us healing ourselves and part of being there as a structure to heal each other and part of uplifting society. So those are all the reasons why I had to do this. <laughs> it, it seems to me that, you know, uh, one, you know, you talk about your childhood and, be, and becoming a doctor. Um, and then it is a series of deeply moving and powerful patient encounters, your story. And it strikes me reading it that you learn so much from your patients and in helping them, you know, they, they help you even, they even help you heal. And, uh, you know, I, I elaborate on that. It's really very symbiotic in a sense, is it not? Um, at least that's the way I read your book that you, you get as much as you give, I think often from some of these folks. I think so. It's interesting because when I, much like writing the book, when I went into medicine, I mean, it's a cliche. I think most of us still say it. We, we wanna be of service and we want to help. But then it is true that through those acts of service, how much we also receive. You know, I spoke about an experience where, um, and, and I know we're all doctors here, so I'll, you know, I'll cut to the chase. <laughs> but but the, early as an attending, a newborn was brought in and we knew that infant had expired, but we still did the medical thing. We worked on this baby because it's a baby much longer than was reasonable, but just to prove to ourselves, to God, to the universe, to the family, right. literally everything was done. And somehow this would, that knowledge would help with the healing process. And then when the family comes in and yes, we, we do have to say what has happened, just holding that space because there's nothing you can do to bring back the baby. It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel fair. This is what has happened. And just holding the space for that grief so that healing can happen. And being part of that, you know what? I don't know what it's like to lose a child. I know what it's like to lose connections, to lose dreams, to, to lose plans for one's life. And so when I went home that night, again, just allowing myself to feel, feel their loss, how it connected to a sense of mine and how that did really provide like a portal to more healing. And again, it wasn't for me, but it, what, it's what happened through that act of, of presencing. Uh, you know, I run a narrative medicine program, okay? And I, I'm a writer all, all my life. And I'm always encouraging doctors and students to pause and to reflect and to tell and share stories. And I'm always promoting the value to them of doing this. And you are, you know, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful example of the fruits of this. So this leads to the next question that I had. And you come to some real discoveries about yourself and about your life and about medicine at the end of the book. I mean, it really is a journey of discovery, your book. Um, had you learned these things before you wrote or was writing the book itself an act of discovery? And in other words, had you healed before you wrote the book and wanted to share your message and story, which is why you wrote, or was writing an important part of the healing and the discovery? So in this case, probably because I was writing about some very painful experiences, right. like. The, the trauma of my childhood or divorce or the breakup of a relationship, I really had to um, get to a good place within myself. I had to have processed that mostly because I'll tell you some of it, the book happened over, 
years before the book contract. I was probably writing it for, I don't know, three years, over three years. So some of it is at the time of the writing, like the more recent breakup, it was newer. So if I hadn't processed enough, I remember when I was writing that chapter, I had to wait and I had to step away. And it, it helped to expedite my healing since I was like, oh, I need to get this done. <laughs> so, so I better work on that spiritual healing right now. So I would say it was both. Okay. I felt comfortable writing it because I had done a lot of work. And, and then again, one of the unanticipated fruits of doing this was um, that much more progress that I had through writing it. And I did not guess that would happen. So tell us a little bit, how did you enjoy the writing process? Was the act of writing this book pleasurable, painful, all of the above? And, and when did you write? You know, I'm really curious, you know, doctors are so busy and, and it's a hard and emotionally exhausting field. You know, what I often ask students after the workshop is, did you enjoy the act of writing in the, you know, the last whatever minutes we spent writing. So I want to ask you, was it a pleasurable experience? It was. Now, you know, I don't know. I think that if you're writing about anything like sensitive human topics, it will be fulfilling. But there were moments when it was, I mean, like I said, very painful right. and I had to step away from it. And I would describe in general, my in general, no matter what I'm writing and maybe because of the subject matter, but my writing process is very meditative. So unfortunately for me, most of my original writing <laughs> happens late at night, like between mm -hmm. nine and 3 a.m., which disrupts everything, but that's when it happens. And I usually have candles and incense. And so I'll say that even if, like when I was writing about the divorce and I said, and then I knew what would happen, Whitney Houston song would play and I would cry. When I had to edit that, I did just start crying because I was re-feeling it all again. But it, it was a magical process because even when it was excruciating afterwards, it was such a release. I mean, it was, it was like anything else. Like if, if I'm in a yoga practice that's painful and I don't know how I'm gonna get through the pose and I'm exhausted, well, at the end, I'm so grateful that I did it and I feel so much better. Writing for me is the same. Thank you. And had you considered yourself a writer beforehand? I mean, there's a great history and tradition of position writers in this country and you're joining that. You know, did you see, was it really meditative and therapeutic that sat you down? Or did you think to myself, I'm a writer, you know, and I want to write. How did you see yourself? I, I think it's important to share that with people. Yeah. Because it's very intimidating to, to a lot of physicians and people say, I'm not a writer. I, you know. I love sharing that part of the story. Okay. Um, and this should be, <laughs> this should be very encouraging to people because I did not consider myself a writer. And it was my private um, course to learn how to write truthfully, um, because that is one of the skills that we were talking a little bit like in the green room before the event started, but one of the skills that was beaten out of me <laughs> during my medical training was learning how to write and to communicate in any kind of lyrical way. Um, but I wanted to get back to it because in my heart, I'm an artist, like I'm the kind of person who, mm -hmm. If it's up to me, my free time will be spent with artists of all kinds and activists. So I wanted to engage in that more fully and directly. And because I was an, an was am still full time am an ER doctor, when I went online looking for writing courses, I could never make the schedule. There's just there's no way. So I created my own kind of curriculum and hired an editor who would be my teacher mm -hmm. and. Um, Long story short, I said, well, I want, to I want to work on writing and I have this idea. So let me just do the book. And so that's how it went. I learned as I went along and I had no idea the trajectory. I didn't even know what, what the end product would be. Right. I literally didn't know what I would do with it when I finished. Like then I hired a consultant. Just So it's been the whole time just learning step by step. Thank you for sharing. I want to pivot a little to the, the substance of the book a little. And Lee, although I could talk about the writing and the writing process all night, there are a few, some lines with lines like these. I'm still of the generation that entered medicine to help people not to be tethered to endless paperwork bludgeoned by satisfaction surveys or the line, the big consideration in comparing hospital jobs is which set of bureaucratic nightmares will cause the fewest number of sleepless nights. You provide a pretty grim view of medicine. 
Um, has your view changed since you wrote this? And what advice do you have for young doctors, med students, residents who are, you know, about to enter the lion's den? I mean, my view has changed because it's probably worse. <laughs> I think it's very important to be honest. And I think that this pandemic, I mean, we're all in it. And what this pandemic has revealed is just the underbelly of the system that's always been there, the deficiencies that have always been there and people who are left behind and mm -hmm. people who are somehow served by it. So because I believe in something better, because I know we can do better to have an equitable society, to have a system that actually delivers healthcare, right? Where everyone has access to healthcare because it's a right, it should be a right, where everyone gets quality care, where there's inclusivity um, within the field. Um, because I believe in that, I think it's worthwhile. And th the only way we're gonna get there is if there are people in the field who share that belief and most importantly are willing to do the work for it. So that's what I say to young physicians, that if that's how you feel, especially we need you, we, we need fellow warriors, we can get it done. For people who read the book, they, they know they have read it. They'll seen by some of your tender descriptions of what a good doctor you are and in how much you love being in the room and even with difficult patients, how you handle it. But it also, it's just, uh, you do paint a pretty grim picture. Well, anyone in medicine is not a surprise to them. In that uh, same vein, uh, you repeatedly ran into glass ceilings and you described those in the book. Uh, you know, you tried to climb the ladder at big academic institutions. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm gonna quote from your book now. It's a passage I, I loved. Michelle, you didn't get the position. I'm sorry to say it, you're qualified. I just can't ever seem to get a black person or woman promoted here. They've decided that even though you were the only applicant and a super qualified one at that, they're just going to leave the position open. I'm so sorry. He had spoken with a heavy, with the heavy heart of a longtime liberal white man who would shake my hand, smile, close the door behind me, and then sit back down in his comfortable, secure chair. His effort was complete. His part was done. I was the one left to live with the limitations of that bigotry. America still has so many more strides to make. I am evidence. I, I love that passage. I wanted to read it. And my question is, is it any better now as the pandemic or the social justice movement and Black Lives Matter had any impact on opportunities in medicine for people of color and women? What's your, what's your perspective now? I would say that what is better is the openness to have a dialogue about it. Because in medicine, there was such a reluctance to even the discussion. So we've made inroads in that way. And, and it's not everywhere, but in some places we've made inroads in that way. Um, have I seen an effect beyond that yet? No, I mean, unfortunately, medicine is kind of like turning a cruise ship or remember that liner that got caught in the channel and it took like yeah. days to release it. So it's way harder than that in medicine. And it doesn't need to be, but it is. So I'm hopeful. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love the, you know, the Suez Canal analogy. That's, that's not a promising analogy, but I, I it doesn't uh, have to be that. that I hard. mean, it was released ultimately. <laughs> it was, it was, released. it was, that's true. Changing a little bit. I interview a lot of doctors. We do a podcast at Temple. And one of the questions I'm always interested in is asking doctors about their path to medicine. And in your introduction, you talked a little bit about the you know, abusive situation you grew up in, but I'm interested in, you know, for those who haven't read your book, share with us a little bit more about your childhood, your challenges, and how that influenced you to become a doctor. And I mean, in retrospect now, I say in many ways, I was like groomed to be an ER doctor because I, I had to use the same skills growing up. All I would have, like, even as a child, is a snapshot in time and had to decide mm -hmm. in the moment, like, is there imminent life threat for us. When I say us, I mean myself, my sister, my brother, mother. Or is this likely not so dangerous um, and it'll blow over soon? Or maybe this moment of relative calm really is calm and we're going to be fine. Get being used to being in those scenarios mm -hmm. and then knowing 
the terror and trauma of it, wanting to heal myself from it, wanting to be there for other people who are presenting with, maybe it's not like the day they're critically ill, but they feel like it might be. Wanting to be there for those people, knowing the importance of being there for those people that ultimately landed me in the ER. You seem to find a, a piece at the end, a balance at the end of your book. You know, it, it definitely is a journey. And this is such a challenge for doctors today to find that balance and that in a piece. Can you share with us a little about, about what lies at the heart of this balance for you? You know, what helps you be happy and fulfilled in life, in medicine? It's really timely. I mean, when this, obviously I couldn't have predicted the pandemic or, right. or anything that would happen in just the, the precarity of our lives now. And I, you know, I don't know all what fields the audience is comprised of or will be, but just the not knowing in, in medicine now, in a field where we thought we would be fine and we would have job security. And now for many of us, like there aren't jobs or pays being cut or hours are being cut. There are health concerns, like concerned about insurance, people have lost loved ones. So when, when I wrote this book, I didn't anticipate that. I mean, I, of course I know though that life is uncertain and I know that it's a journey and I know that how we manage any situation will prepare us for the next. And, and I think it's that, that knowing that grounds me and helps me navigate the challenges. And, you know, then I have my practices like my yoga practice or now I work in Jersey. So the only good thing about that commute on 95 is that like I, I listen to audiobooks by like Eckhart Tolle to prepare myself mm -hmm. for driving on 95 and then also for getting to work. I think that's my grounding principle and then some of my practices. Thank you. That, that is, you're, you're faithful to yoga. I know that. And daily or, or uh, and you do classes or what do you, you know, how do you do that? So ever since the pandemic, I've been like, luckily my, my studio, we can log in and, and practice yeah, remotely. Right. It started in person, but I'm still just doing remote practice. But regularly when I'm on my non-clinical days, so I'd say maybe three times a week, I still practice. I'm looking forward for the day when like we can safely be in studio. I mean, I also, I really believe in masks and I follow the rules. I also cannot do yoga in a mask, right. which is why I stay in my living room and log into class. Right, 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 right. And Dr. Harper, I, I told you, I think I was done with the writing, but I'm, I want to come back and ask you one more writing question. I think it's a really important one. It's one I wrestle with in working with medical students and doctors. And I want to ask you about it. Because I think we have or may have a lot of aspiring physician writers, I hope we do, in the audience. The question is, patients come to you for help mm -hmm. uh, not to be written about. Yeah. So how do you balance telling your story and protecting their privacy? Well, I mean, first, there's just the basics of confidentiality and changing identifying information. And I will say in this book, because I didn't know the publication process, so mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I have a book deal. The book's going to come out next week. No, it was almost two years later. So yeah. there's also the benefit of just time. I mean, unless you're going to write it in the moment and then self-publish. So there's some protection because of, of the time of just how long it takes. But not knowing that, I did backflips. Like there were a couple notable cases. I even changed their location so people wouldn't be able to figure it out. So, so there's tools like that. Um, but something else I do is that when I go to the ER, I purposely say to myself, I am just here. It's not about writing about anyone. It sounds silly, but I, I feel, for some reason, I feel like it's important to say, when I'm working, I, I don't take notes for writing, nor do I that evening. And then as, as writing comes to me later, then yeah, I may pull from my experiences, but on a shift, even after a shift that week, I, I just leave it because I need that separation because I agree. People are not there to be content for a, a book. Right, right. Or, no, <laughs> but it is a hard call yet. It's your story. And, you know, you like, obviously the people who die or you, they're coming, they're gone. They can't ever consent. And yet, you know, it's your, your story too. Right. But I mean, it, it's, so I'm, I think it's a very difficult and challenging balance. And I, I wanted to explore that with you. I mean, right. some of your characters are so well-developed, you know, they, they come alive in the book and, and some of the patients you describe, and I wonder, is it conceivable they could recognize themselves and, 
would that be okay? You know, sort of what is your standard of, for privacy? And, and I, what advice can you offer other writers who may wrestle with that? Because you're in the room, right? And, and that's a privilege and also a source of, you know, you see life, uh, William Carlos Williams, what he used to say, what you see in a day with ordinary patients is greater than what the greatest statesman would ever experience or see. So that was a rambling long-winded question, but you kind of get my point there. It's a really good question. And I, I've thought to myself, there's something about being an ER doctor that makes it easier because we see a high volume of patients and we don't have follow-up. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you the truth. I don't, I don't even know how people who have, who are in primary care or have a practice where they have regular patients or psychiatrists, truthfully, I, I don't know how it would happen if you have a long-term, unless you're writing about someone who is no longer your patients. I mean, in the ER, we just see so many people. It's hard. Now I've had cases of mistaken identity <laughs> where, for example, a colleague said like, oh, I saw, I know that patient. Now I use pseudonyms in the book. But I was like, oh, you do. And I never confirm nor deny. So I said to her, I can't tell you anything. However, who is it you saw? Now she told me the person's name and described them. First of all, I knew the name, so it wasn't the patient. And it was, the description was wrong as well. So it isn't interesting. I've not yet had anyone identify themselves, but I've had people think they knew what I was talking about and they didn't. <laughs> so. Right. Well, in this case, you're talking about an Afghan vet, a war veteran who yeah. was sexually assaulted, right? That, yeah. That patient. And I imagine there are many, 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 you know, sadly, who are in that yeah. case. So, but it's, we try to encourage the students to write about what they feel and what, you know, don't try to imagine what the patient thought or you know, only write what you know, because that's true. That's what you can write. So I, I love to ask doctors who write their boundaries on this, because I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, I think we should open it up to the audience here. All right. So I'm going to go to the Q&A, Dr. Harper, and see what we have here. I can, there, this is from anonymous attendee. So uh, here we go. Um, how do you differentiate between compartmentalizing patients and encounters as not to bring those feelings home versus letting yourself fully feel that interconnectedness you mentioned? I have difficulty turning off, per se, after my shift. It is a good question. And I will say that because in our field, we have to do a lot of compartmentalizing like in the ER, like mm -hmm. while I'm coding a child, I just need to do the code. When I speak to the family, some of that guard comes down as I'm present, but not all of it because there's other patients in the ER and I just have to keep moving. And I bring that up to say that I feel like the only time to feel it fully is when you're not there. So that's when I process after or, or before, whenever, mm -hmm. outside of the shift. And I feel like it's through the process of experiencing it fully that we can move past it. Now, of course, if a person is already struggling with other aspects of their life, like there's a, there's a time and a place to do this, right? If you're fighting for your survival and you're already super depressed or stressed out taking care of a family member who has a metastatic cancer, it may not be the time to feel things fully, right? You, you get through what you need to, but when, when you are in a safe place that you can process and feel, I think that's the only way to do it, to move past it. I hope that answers the question. I hope so. I, I want to piggyback on that. I know of other physician writers who say that, and it's an interesting thought that what you said, you can only really fully feel and experience it after it's over and you're reflecting on it later. You know, they often write to sort of slow it down and really process what, it, what happened. And they, you know, you can't do it in a moment because you're being a doctor. And one of the great values of narrative medicine reflection is taking that moment to process and me metabolize your, your experiences. And Another question here. Uh, since we're talking about the meat of the book, you have illustrated the inherent biases within the ranks of medicine and how there were so many barriers to women of color advancing. Since the quote comes directly from a fellow of the College of the Physicians, how can the college learn from these activities, statements, positions of its own brethren? My answer is always the same, like when it's a question about what can we do. I think there's the courage that is required to be radically honest about how an institution is functioning. 
who are considered the stakeholders, who mm -hmm. is promoted, hired, who is supported, to have the courage to bear witness and have honesty about it, and then the bravery to act from that place of integrity. Because um, it's not enough just to know. You know, I talk about that, the quote where I was passed over. Was I even passed over? I was, I was the only applicant. I just right. wasn't hired. <laughs> I just wasn't hired. And my director said, said it many times, how the institution just doesn't promote or hire women or people of color. They just don't. And he also told me, and that's why they always leave. And because I knew people after leaving, and I did leave, I was told that after I left, they felt it was a good time to explore that more and hire. And they hired a white male nurse for the position. So it's not enough to know because everyone there knew it's, it's the other part, the courage to act and also to hold institutions and ourselves because we make up the institutions accountable. Thank you, Dr. Harper. Uh, another question from the uh, Q and A, do you see yourself practicing medicine long-term? So many people recently are working so they have an exit strategy. It's really true. And even before the pandemic, pretty much every, you know, the electronic journals we get, some paper journals too, for emergency medicine would have essays about or articles, how to leave medicine, like what to do. So I get it. I will say that because my mission is to be part of healing, which I feel I can do in the ER, and also that's why I write, and then I can do it on a larger scale outside of the ER. I don't want to leave medicine now. I mean, even if somebody deposited $50 million in my bank account, now I, I would take certain safety precautions, but I would still wanna practice emergency medicine. I'm not ready to leave. Um, there's more work to be done. And yes, you said what I disclosed about medicine was pretty dismal, that's true but I want to change it. <laughs> so I'm not ready to abandon medicine. This question comes from Heidi Wakeman. I'm using her name because it's on the chat. And she asks, uh, who are some authors that you admire or listen to? Do you ever read poetry? By the way, you are awesome, all caps. And I can't <laughs> wait to reread your book. Thank you. So I, I will, okay, I'm going to say a couple things. People that I love are Toni Morrison, um, James Baldwin, Audre Lorde, and I want to read a lot more. And this has been such a busy year with publicity and speaking that I literally, in, in the entryway, in the corridor, I have a stack of books, like, like, like this high, a stack of books that I need to get to. So I'm looking forward to reading cast, which I started and I want to finish. We Contain Multitudes um, by Yang. Oh, there's this great book, these researchers out of the UK looking at how inequality in societies leads to poor health outcomes at all income strata. So, I mean, so there's some great books I need to get back to. One thing I have been reading, because I have to read something, even just little snippets of something to keep going is The New Yorker. So I think that feeds that need a little bit until I can carve out more time. You know, Dr. Harper, when I was a young reporter, I had a summer job and I lived with this journalist who had a house full of books, a house full of books. And I was totally intimidated and overwhelmed and said, how am I ever going to read all these books? And I felt the weight really heavy on me, like uh, I, I should read all. And he, he said, you have it all wrong. Do not look at this as like a burden or obligation. Look at this as you'll never run out of great things to read. Do not ever feel the pressure that you have to read all this. Just so, I mean, we all, things pile up and time is short, but I've tried to, you know, use that philosophy that instead of feeling like I'll never get to all these, that I'll never run out of wonderful things to read. There is more, more questions here. Uh, what's your favorite thing to write about that isn't medicine? We'll see. I'm new to this. I only have one book, but I think <laughs> I'll stay in the vein of mostly nonfiction, mm -hmm. just because it feels most natural to me. And if I'm not writing about medicine, I don't know, but it's all connected. It's all healing. Like I like writing about spirituality. I like writing about themes around identity, trauma and healing, intergenerational trauma, 
Yeah, those are the topics. And then I'm going to stop myself because I will accidentally talk about my next book, which I won't do. <laughs> you, you, well, that was my question. What are you working on? You know, are you working on a new book? Another book? I am. All right. It's, again, it's time though, but I started jotting down notes and I have some, and I spoke to my editor and I'm exploring themes, but I am, I kind of can't talk about it for two reasons. I'm superstitious and I won't talk about anything until it's sold really. But then I also can't talk about it because it's not fully formulated. So it just works out. <laughs> Will there be another, it won't be a memoir, but it'll be, it'll be your, well, you will look forward to it when it, when it comes. <laughs> when it happens. I, I don't see it. I want to ask you another question of my own. You know, you live in Philadelphia or you came to Philadelphia. Your life had fallen apart when you arrived. You also came with great trepidation. It was a cold city. You weren't thinking you were going to be happy here. And you, I don't know how many years you've been here now, but talk about your view of Philadelphia as a place to live and work, I guess, but just your transformation on uh, your view of Philadelphia, because we're all Philadelphians here, most of us probably in this, I assume, in the Zoom. Well, I have really enjoyed um, the art scene. I mean, I was coming here from New York City, and I'm from D.C., so I'm a Northeasterner at heart. I, I love visiting other places, but I think just culturally, the Northeast works for my sensibilities. <laughs> But the art here was more accessible than in New York. I mean, this is all pre-COVID. It's easier to get tickets. It's, it's easier to get in the lecture hall or into a museum for an event. So that's been great. And the food, same thing, cost of living. So I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> I wanted to ask you this too, uh, while we, we have a few more minutes. I don't exactly know who our audience is. I'm assuming it's a lot of students, I'm hoping, but I want to ask you about your COVID experience as a doctor, what it was like for you. You know, a lot of students were sort of shut out of the hospital for the, a lot of it and their lives were disrupted. What was your ER experience like or ED experience like? Could you tell us a little bit about your uh, life as a doctor during COVID? It's gone through phases right now because we were all learning about this mm -hmm. together. And initially it was terrifying. And I think that as a physician, there was the not knowing. I mean, we're ER doctors, so we're used to dealing with chaos and just making the best of circumstances. But they were seeing so many people ill and not knowing what to do and having no, no data or science to really back us up. Mm -hmm. There was not having the equipment to take care of ourselves or the patients um, appropriately without endangering ourselves. There was also, as an ER doctor, knowing that we were going to stay the course. We were going to be there to take care of people. It makes me kind of emotional because at a time when almost everything was being shut down and people were going to telemedicine and virtual and not accepting patients, we were there and we were going to be there no matter what, even though we felt betrayed by the same system who were, was having us there with, without appropriate measures. It's improved, of course. I mean, obviously, you know, people right. getting vaccinated, taking precautions, immunity, uh, lower volumes. So it's been a range of emotions. I actually, towards the beginning of it, I wrote an essay about it in Medium about right. the, the emotional experience of being in that system and feeling like a disposable tool in the ER. On a cheerier subject, I guess, tell us a little bit about what it's been like for you. You know, you're a doctor. You did not set out in life to be a writer. You had no really experience with celebrity and with, you know, the heat and light of the bestseller list and 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 being at the eye of the storm in that regard. You know, even though you can't be in big auditoriums yet, what's it been like for you come, you know, having no idea what this world was like to suddenly being a best-selling author and, uh, you know, physician writer. It's been a little strange because this has happened during a pandemic. So it's me sitting in my office in front of a screen, not knowing who I'm speaking to or like right. what their reaction is. <laughs> so a lot of it doesn't feel real. Even when I was on the daily show and I thought, oh my God, I get to meet oh. Trevor Noah. But now I get to meet him like this. Like I can't even go to New right. York. Right. What a drag. You can <laughs> exactly. Go. exactly. Right. I love New York City. And like, how right. cool would it be to be on set at The Daily Show? Right. But it's it's been like this. So I'm 
exceedingly grateful. And it's been super fun to spend time with so many interesting people, but part of it doesn't feel real. So it'll be interesting right. as the world opens up and I can see humans and go to auditoriums. I think it's just more to look forward to. It's been great and I think it'll be more fun. And you know, if I can keep doing more projects, then I can explore this path more. I actually have a question for you, but I see as I'm getting ready to ask it that we have another question in the Q&A from, from a, one of our, our one best, of, our wonderful Temple students, soon to be doctors, Miranda Hassam is just about to graduate. Her question is, you talked about wanting to stay in medicine to make changes for the better and how outside of medicine you identify and find community with people working in advocacy. The question is, do you see your writing as a tool for advocacy? What role do you think writing plays as a physician, as advocate? Um, I do. I am a firm believer when people say the way someone does anything is the way they do everything. That's just true, you know, unless someone is severely dissociative. I mean, other, it's, it's true. That's how we operate. So yes, I believe in advocacy work and the writing achieves that in a way that can't be done in the ER. I mean, yeah, so powerful, our interaction with each patient. And so maybe something is healed in that moment with that one person or that one family or maybe that one community. But then with writing, potentially, there are no borders. I mean, I've, I've had conversations with people in multiple countries, like all over this country and in other countries and continents, obviously. So it's potentially very powerful. It's also a lot of fun and powerful. We're almost out of time here, but um, I guess I wanted to comment on a couple of things and, and ask you one. Uh, first of all, I love your notion of, of uh, radical honesty. I think that it plays into the answer to the last question too. I think the advocacy starts with radical on honesty. And I think we all are needing a dose of that these days as a country. I appreciate that. The other thing that I think is really striking is how you have taken a, a vulnerable an, a approach to talking about your own breaking in the context where we're not really, our culture, our medical culture doesn't exactly promote vulnerability. And you've used it in such an optimistic way. I mean, it's, it is a hopeful way. And to say that this is our, our way of, of doing better, you're on a personal level and, and perhaps on a system or a country level, uh, I guess that's what I'm taking from it. I, and I don't know if you want to comment on, on those things. I love that that's what you took from it. It's often what I mean, just in general. <laughs> and I think that there's so much strength that happens from being wi willing to be honest. And that often includes being willing to be vulnerable. Now, don't get me wrong, boundaries are important, but I think that often in medicine, it's not unique to medicine, but medicine is one of those institutions where we've been, it's like wearing armor that we don't need that inhibits our growth and connection. So I think we can let that down, that we can be honest, we can feel, and we can grow. Absolutely. Thank you. You, you know, Dr. Harper, I was thinking about, you know, Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy, and he has a beautiful passages in there about being broken at the end, which I sometimes use excerpts from that in my workshops. And when you talk about being broken in the vase and, and the healing, it made me think of that and what happened to him. And I say that with as a, as a big compliment to you, because that's that's good company to be to be in. But I, I really I, th I saw the parallels there. I wanted to ask, you know, you also you put your personal life deeply on the line for the world to read. I, I you know, there's a real, as Dr. Reifler noted, a real vulnerability in that. I wanted to ask you about your father. You the end of the book by sort of this beautiful um, interaction with your father. Are you in contact with him now? Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, sort of how that what was the next chapter there? What happened afterwards? We are in communication. I will put this, I'll put it this way. Mm -hmm. Everyone is on their own path, different stage of the journey. So what I said in there is true that forgiveness condones nothing, but it allows healing. Mm -hmm. It freed me, it freed him to achieve whatever was meant to be next in our lives. 
at the same time, forgiving someone doesn't mean that they have access to your life. Um, and, and for me, I believe it doesn't matter who you are. If you're toxic, I can't enable that. Um, it can't hinder me and I can't enable it. So I bless it and let it go. That was a long way of saying that we are vaguely in communication, which brings me to a point. I, I know when you were saying boundaries and confidentiality, when it comes to writing about patients, I feel like I've mastered how to do that in a way that is safe and respectful. Mm. Um, and it's easier for me to do and adhere to those boundaries. For my personal life though, since these are, all, I mean, many of them through my family members, they're still my family. And if they're exes, I mean, I'm the kind of person I don't, I don't bad mouth exes. I mean, if I'm gonna be honest and if it's not favorable, fine, but my intention specifically not to bad mouth anyone. I'm just not a vengeful person. And so I would often ask myself the question when after I had written a passage, okay, sure, is this honest? Does it cross the line to be mean or cruel? Or are you feeling any spite when you write this? Mm -hmm. And I would reevaluate based on that criteria because it, it's really important for me to tell my story, to tell it in a way that I think serves the mission of honesty and healing and that could be helpful to other people and to do it in a way that is respectful of the privacy of others. And I felt that was much trickier when it came to people in my personal life. Right. We could talk to you for a long time because this is really wonderful having a chance to talk, but I think to be fair to everyone, we, we need to, to call time. Dr. Harper, where should people buy your book? Do you have any recommendations or suggestions? Okay. Well, I always say an independent bookstore, whatever local or, or otherwise independent bookstore is great to support. And then, I mean, it, it is available like everywhere or bookshop.org too. They give money to independent bookstores, but it's at the major chains as well. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the conversation. I enjoyed talking to you and uh, I hope we talk again. Dr. Reifert, thank you for asking me to host. Audience, thank you for joining in. I also want to acknowledge Dr. Glass, who is one of the panelists who, for, who, who wrote the review of your book for the uh, NYU uh, Literature and Medicine Database and, and made the connection in the first place. So thank you, Dr. Glass. Um, but most of all, thank you, Dr. Harper. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. This was so much fun.